Commissioner candidate debate. My name is Adina Campbell and I am part of the Legislative District 66 leadership and I appreciate you guys coming here and also thank you to the candidates for setting time aside. I know your schedules are packed so thank you so much for being here. We also welcome Spanish Fork Channel uh, 17 who's going to be recording the event and replaying it um, on our local network here in Spanish Fork. I have also asked other people to record this event digitally so that we can put it online for people who didn't have an opportunity to be here. So that's gonna be happening too. So you're on the record, boys. Just be aware, okay. Nice. Anyway, thank you so much for being here and also thank you to our moderator, Doug Welton. He is the debate coach at Salem Hills High and his team took state this year. I know. Very impressive. It's like a celebrity in our midst. Um, so, and he has a very busy schedule too, so we really do appreciate him being here. And I also know you guys have busy, busy schedules, so thank you so much for doing your diligence as county de delegates. Okay, we are going to start with a prayer and a pledge, and then we're going to start the debate. We only have this auditorium for a limited amount of time, so we're going to have Doug ask the questions, he'll explain the process, and then um, if you want to speak individually to any of the candidates afterwards, you are welcome to do so out in the foyer so that we can get the lights turned down and the doors closed to the auditorium. So our delightful tech students who are high school students volunteering their time tonight. Thank you, everybody. Let's clap for them. Um, so that they can go home <laughs> while you guys still ask questions individually to the candidates out in the foyer. Okay, so I have asked... Um, Nick Christensen, a, a county delegate in my precinct, Spanish Fork 15, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag is right here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. My name is Brad Frost. Um, I'm from American Fork, born and raised there but I've always felt akin to Spanish Fork. My, my, this is where much of my posterity was born and raised and buried in Spanish Fork Cemetery. So I come here often and reflect upon them. And so, uh, but I personally, I'm married, five children, uh, two grandchildren, two of my daughters are married and, and that really was a game changer for us this year as we've had two grandchildren in our lives. And, I thought I loved my kids until I had grandkids and I knew a whole new level of love. So professionally, I'm a landscaper, I'm a contractor, and I've been in that arena for about 15 years. Prior to that, I uh, uh, had a trash business which I sold after just outworking my competitors. I think I was an irritant to them and they bought me out. And that was my plan from the beginning and uh, it worked. So, uh, but uh, so, I, uh, I love service. I serve in my city council in American Fork. And through that, I've learned how to go through detailed budgetary processes with staff and uh, to know how important that is. It's a, it's a big deal in government and that sets priorities. I have observed on the county level a very lack of transparency. And I think that is kind of like termites that uh, will erode government if transparency is not there. Simple fix, but transparency. And then one of my platform issues that I think is very relevant, something that I've spent a lot of time in, and I've been fighting for a canyon. And it's water for the, about almost the quarter of the county. And 200,000 people are at risk. And so I've invested a great deal of time and effort as a citizen and as a council member in any position of, of influence that I've had to hold a corporate uh, America accountable. Thank you. So my name is Nathan Ivey, and, and I want to thank each of you for being here. And it's truly an honor for me to have the opportunity to be here. To give you a little background on who I am and where I come from, when I was about 13 years old, I'd come home from school to our little one acre lot in Bluffdale, and I'd go out to our barn, and I'd get a football, and I'd try and throw it through a tire because I wanted to be the next Dan Marino. And if you have a chance to stand next to me, you'll understand that genetics let me down on my football career. 
And so I turned to my, my love and passion, and, and that's horses. And I had a dream to, to build and develop a, a top-rate, first-class horse ranch. And today, when I walk out of my door, that dream's become a reality. We've been able to turn that one-acre, six-stall barn into a, a thousand-acre, million-dollar operation that's home to to the Utah's leading reigning horse sire. And so the promises of, of America have afforded me an opportunity to pursue my dreams and to achieve my dreams. But that promise started way back in, in 1728 when my grandfather, the Reverend Rhodes, settled in Virginia. And, and he did something. He spoke to his children about religious freedom and self-governance. And the Ivy side of my family took those whispers and they spoke them out loud when they took their guns and fought in the Revolutionary War. My ancestors then carried that spirit west, and that's a spirit that rests inside of me. It's a spirit that embraces the principles of America. It embraces limited government, and a government that fights to protect the three most important things in our life, and that's life, liberty, and property. And I believe that when we adhere to the Constitution, we give people the greatest opportunity to succeed. I'm in this race because when I look at my children, I want to make sure that they have the same opportunities that the promise of America has afforded to me. And that's why I'm in this race, is to fight for those principles, to ensure that we continue to pass on that dream and legacy that my ancestors have gave to me to future generations. My name is Mike Kipp. My background includes being in the military for 10 years. That during that time frame, I spent all of that time in the Navy SEAL teams, did just under, or just right at 900 missions, a little over. In the intelligence community is where that actually falls when you're in special warfare groups, led me into different areas in major contracting and working with our State Department, our Defense Department, working with large-scale developers, large companies, Raytheon, Boeing, uh, numbers of others, and actually opening up trade and business relationships with those companies and the State Department to different foreign countries. So I'm pretty familiar, familiar on an international basis on how large-scale business runs and the economics that are associated with it. Coming back into the States, I became a large-scale contractor and not where I owned the company, but acting on a consulting basis on the different projects that were associated with it. There's probably not any federal, state, or uh, county, city regulatory issue that I haven't had to deal with, or the EPA. Here in Utah, we have some unique issues. Right now, we have some that are fairly emotional, some that are um, actually quite crucial and critical. When I look at the leadership skills that I bring to the uh, table in dealing with how we're handling different expansion ratios, looking at the watershed, looking at the different areas on how we're having people come together. In the last three and a half years, we look at 30,000 families that have moved in and what that's doing to the infrastructure. That's half of the current growth rate. And we need to be able to ta start taking a look at all of the different critical nature issues that are facing the county. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Scott Ward. I am a local resident of Spanish Fork. I was born and raised in California, but came to Utah after transferring to BYU and completing my education there. I received a bachelor's in economics and a master's of public administration. After that, I uh, worked in local government, spent some time there, then got recruited by a private telecom co company, and so I did some regulatory work for them. Eventually, I decided to pursue my dream of being an entrepreneur and somewhat of a, a philanthropist, if you will, by getting involved in the community. That was taught to me by my parents, both of which who were edu educators and very involved in the community. In fact, six of my, parent, my siblings or six of my parents' children all have some sort of career in public service in some way, whether it's law enforcement, um, local government, or... Um, armed forces. And so I'm in this race because as a almost 30 year resident of Utah County, I'm concerned about being able to maintain the quality of life that we have here in, in Utah County. Fortune Magazine consistently ranks Utah County, Provo Orem, as one of the best places to live. Right now we have a little bit of intrusion of even local government on some of our individual rights 
and I'm running for county commissioner so that I can make sure that the government remembers its proper role, that our rights are protected, that we're able to enjoy a, a strong, high quality of life, providing the recreational opportunities, balancing economic growth with the ability to raise our kids and preserve that for generations to come. Thank you. Um, my name is Casey Vokes, and I'm the immediate past chairman of the Utah County Republican Party. Um, those of you that have been delegates over the last few, few years probably watched me run a couple of those meetings. Um, I am the founding owner of Discovery Space Center, and I've been very actively involved in a lot of these county issues over the last couple of years. Um, something that I, I've become particularly concerned about in our nation right now is the trend of campaign conservatives. People that get up and they have a certain message that they want to advertise, but then the moment that they take office, there is a complete reversal of those positions. I think that in order to avoid that, we've got to go with people that are proven conservatives, consistent conservatives. This is one of the reasons that Ted Cruz has me listed as one of his uh, Utah leaders that endorsed him early. Um, these kinds of things, I think, in our, in our Utah County Republican Party, there were a lot of issues that came to my attention while I was the chairman. There was pay increases for the commission. There were... Um, intent to write a blank check to UTA. That was certainly going to take us in a completely wrong direction. When you look at what UTA has as a track record through the 2014 legislative audit report, that's a huge indicator that that is an irresponsible organization. Any organization that is quasi-government in nature that doesn't have accountability mechanisms is something that needs to be put, in, put on notice. I think that as you vet the candidates, I encourage you to remember the, the advice and the counsel that Daniel Webster gives us when he says that no danger to our country from a foreign foe will take us down. From our inattention of the people to the concern, the, okay. Okay, the first question, this was brought up by many, uh, kind of in a roundabout way by a couple of the candidates and, and directly. The first question is, is, is this, often in these debates, many of the Republican candidates espouse the same values. I often joke that if you, if you get a tear in your eye and you talk about the Constitution, then you're going to get elected, but what does that mean? So what we look for, and, and by the way, that's important, but how do we know that you are what you say you are? So tell me some things that differentiate yourself from the other candidates. So on 80 to 95% of the issues, I would assume you're the same or pretty close to it. How do you differentiate yourself from the other can candidates? Well, you know, as he talks about the Constitution, I have uh, made an oath. I've raised my arm to the square and taken an oath to uphold the Constitution as a member of the City Council. And I, I don't take that lightly. And in that, I think if, if we would say what's to differentiate us, I, I think that might be what the, the very thing. Uh, and in so doing, I, I, I have the full levity of how I represent other individuals and, and the manner in which I represent them. They have trust in me. They have voted me in. And I take that uh, very seriously. And so um, I look at that and think, what can I do to improve upon my community and to uphold those principles of the Constitution? I would say that I am not a scholar, but I understand it. I understand it's what, it, what it's meant to be, and I uphold it in my office as I currently sit on the city council. Thank you. I think uh, it's a very fair question to ask how can you determine if we are truly what we say we are. I mentioned that I'm a constitutional conservative. A conservative is an individual who's very slow to change. I've worn the exact same Wrangler cowboy cut jeans my whole entire life. A few years ago, Wrangler came out with this relaxed fit thigh and waist that was a little more comfortable. So now I wear Wrangler cowboy cut jeans with a relaxed thigh. So I'm slow to change, and that's what a conservative is. And, and if you look at the history of my life, you'll see that I've been very, very consistent at adhering to those principles. As far as something that distinguishes me from these other candidates is my background. 
I've grown up as a rancher making my living off the land. I'm a CEO, I'm a chief financial officer, I'm a janitor, I'm a stall cleaner, I'm a mechanic, I maintain my buildings. I have a very diverse skill set that, that working in the agricultural field has forced me to, to have. And I'm also the only person on this stage that's a resident of unincorporated county. The decisions that are made at the commissioner's office directly affect me and I do not have a city to buffer me from those from those particular things. I respect Frost's uh, running. I, this is my local office that I'm running for. For me, the Constitution is perhaps a little different and a little more special than, than for a lot of people. When I entered the military and after I qualified uh, to be a full-fledged operator in the Navy SEAL teams, I took an oath of office, and that oath of office was to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That oath did not come with an expiration date, and I have a lot of fallen comrades that died protecting the Constitution. So when I look at the Constitution, it's a cornerstone to our form of government. It's not a living gut document like so many would have that can be changed at the will of powerful people. It is what builds our country and is the start of the fabric of who we call ourselves, which is Americans. Thank you. We're all familiar with the phrase, by your fruits you shall know them. And virtually my entire adult life I have been involved in community service or community activities or local government in one way, shape, or form. Just most recently, I helped organize a group of concerned citizens about a potential proposed tax increase to build a humongous 140,000 square foot life center here in Spanish Fork. It was going to be the size of the the rec center that Provo has were only 40,000 people. It was going to cost $45 million. They were going to increase our local property taxes 166%. It would have been a 15% increase in our overall property taxes. And I don't believe that local governments should be in the business of competing with services that are provided or should be provided by the, the public or the private sector. So. I've demonstrated that through being uh, a member of the Provo Orem Chamber of Commerce and other activities. Okay, again, my name is Casey Vokes, and I think I learned my lesson from last time. I'll make sure I don't do that again. Um, first of all, what separates me is I think that there is an absolutely consistent record on many different conservative issues that are important to the people of this county. This place stands apart from much of the country in many ways, including the political belief that you are the best steward over your property and you are the best person to chart your own course. That's one of the reasons that I've adhered to the principles of limited government and representative government by being a huge advocate of the caucus convention system. While I was chairman, I led the fight and advocated for fundraising that led to raising $25,000 to help that legal battle. Bus rapid transit, as far as I know, I'm the only candidate up here that signed a petition along with 12,000 people in this, campaign, in this county opposing it. The Proposition 1 tax held 20 count town halls with Commissioner Bill Lee across this county, getting information out there about this issue. Thank you. So the next question is, as you see it, what is the greatest need in Utah County right now uh, that your job as commissioner would address? And how do you plan on going about addressing it if elected? I believe there's several, but the one I would put as the greatest need is water, and it's because nobody ever talks about it, and it's life-sustaining, and we all rely upon it every single day to stay alive. We have to address our water issue. I have three specific areas that we do that. The first thing we do is we start now at, at long-term water storage solutions. It's a long process, but if we don't start now, we're not going to have the opportunity to have deliverable water to the growing population. The second thing is we understand what true water conservation is. The third thing that we need to do there is end subsidizing of, of water use. 
If people would have to start paying for what they consume, the consumption would go down. We're the second driest state. We're always one of the highest consuming. So that's because water's subsidized. It's the life-sustaining element that we rely on every single day. If we want to stay alive, we need to make sure we have a safe, readily available water source. There's a lot of different needs that we're being faced with right now, and they're going to increase significantly over the next three years. We've had an economic boom and amazing growth in the county, which is phenomenal. But with that, as I'd mentioned earlier, we have 30,000 new families that have come into the area over the last three and a half years. Right now, we're not having a huge strain on some of our infrastructure. That goes way beyond the roads, by the way. That involves your electrical grids, your sewage treatment plants, your water treatment plants, the different areas with the watershed in general. We have 30% of our water comes from aquifers, which means well water. Are we protecting it as we take a look at the growth and where we're putting our communities and how we're doing the, the um, allowing developers to come in and where we're allowing them to build. Right now we're not having anything as far as water study management, as far as aquifer and where they're going. So what I'm looking at is one of the biggest areas is actually taking a look at the infrastructure that's required. I agree with some of the comments that have been made. I would add that water is perhaps a subset of what I feel is the most important issue for the county and that is managing growth. Um, right now we have over 615,000 people in our county. Our roads uh, have needs. We don't have enough water. Uh, we won't have enough water to accommodate the growth. The growth also impacts air quality and air quality is going to be a huge issue. We're one of the dirtiest places, even worse than California in, in many places. And so adequately providing the Capitol buildings for our Sheriff's Department, our law enforcement, Right now, we're, most of our facilities for law enforcement are out here in, in South County. It takes an hour and a half or, or longer to get to some parts of the county. So adequately providing the capital infrastructure as well as the environmental impacts and the, and the zoning and, and proper growth management strategies, I think is vital for our, our county. I think water with regards to growth is certainly probably one of the biggest issues, but I think we, we have a very deep problem right now in the county, um, especially with regards to public perception, and that is with a transparency question, which is why my boys were handing you those flyers at the door. I think that when it comes to transparency, when you have lost public confidence as a commission and you have the immediate past commissioner a month and a half ago getting arrested for impersonating an LDS church official, you have a serious problem with regards to public confidence. When there's the questions that have been highlighted by various groups, including the groups from um, the American Fort Canyon folks, the Proposition 1 folks, the BRT folks, the different people that were concerned about pay raises, all of these different concerned citizen groups, the number one thing that we've expressed throughout all of this process is when you have 9 a.m. commission meetings on a Tuesday, that signals to the public that they don't want to hear from you. There's not a desire to have that input. There's other arguments that are given for why they put it at that time, but let's signal to the public that we want their input. Let's have the meetings be recorded. Um, when you talk of a single issue, uh, that's hard. Uh, but So I think that maybe the best way that I can address one issue is with an all-encompassing issue, and that is just two days ago, the governor signed what the uh, House Bill 219. It's called the Resource Management Plan. And what that will do is will mandate all counties in the state of Utah to analyze all their resources, one being the one that we would, uh, I think, generally agree with is the number one thing of life-sustaining water, agriculture, um, transportation needs. And so when I think of, if I could say one thing, I would think it would be House Bill 219 and adhering to what it proposes to be, and that is an overarching planning process to make sure we don't get the cart before the horse in anything that we do and that we plan accordingly in this county. And it's in concert with the cities and it's in concert with all the other surrounding counties because we're all on the same team here. Many of the issues discussed here were city issues. Thank you. Okay, next question we'll start with Mr. Kip. Um, 
this goes along with uh, what has been mentioned uh, a couple times already. And for many years, county delegates have, have heard promises that we will, we will add transparency to, to the county commissioner meetings. And they've promised over years that they would move their meetings to an afternoon time or an evening time and record them so they can be available. However, in all these years, it has never happened despite all the promises that have been given to us. So uh, the question, this, this came from, from a several residents, and it says, uh, forgive us for being skeptical, but what is your plan to actually make it happen? You can say you'll change meetings all you want, but how will you make it happen? It's never happened yet, how will it happen? Well, interestingly enough, I actually had some conversations today because I was asked last night on how do you get the meetings to be held in the evening? Different city councils are able to do that. Can you do it twice a, twice a, a month in sometime in the evening? Well, the simple answer would be yes, you can. And it, it, don't, it isn't necessarily an issue with the commissioners. It's part of the funding on the staff that supports them in keeping the building open. Now, how the level, how valid that is, there are dollars that are associated with it. But I think that we can take a look at different ways to where we do have things, to where people can come and actually have an input in the evenings. But it's going to take more than just, oh, let's just do it. There's actually other issues that come into play as we take a look at it. So it is one that has to be methodically worked through, not one that you're just going to be able to say, wow, let's just do it. I think it's a good idea. but there's more to it than just saying it's a good idea. There actually is dollars that are involved with it. This is a great question because this is something that's come up in many of my Meet the Candidate events and discussions with some of you as, as delegates. And I guess my answer is my, one of my first motions would be to um, make a proposal where we change. All public hearings have to be held during the evening. There can be no public hearings that are held during the daytime and it doesn't mean that we have to move all commission meetings to the evening time, but I believe that two things. Number one, the public has a right to not have to leave their jobs in order to attend a public hearing, that we make a mechanism for them to provide input if they can't attend. And number three is that we do not have any commission decisions until at least one week following any public hearing. Additionally, what I'm going to do out of my own time is set up town hall meetings to meet with all of you in the various locations so that we can head off and understand some of the issues that you plan to be raising before those public hearings come up. Thank you. Great, thank you. This is important. You have one minute to, to vet a very critical issue and I want to make sure that we're clear on this. The tr the, all of the proposals that you see that, I that we had handed out Every single one of those, I've sat down with Commissioner Lee, evaluated if he would be on board with them, and so far, so good. Sounds like we've got, we've got a game plan. The argument from some people is that you're somehow making it difficult for the county bureaucrats if you move it to a different time. That's, it's the purpose of government is not to operate at their own convenience. It's to provide access to the public. It's to be, to have those gestures of willingness and wanting to hear from the people's input. And that's the problem that we have in government, is when government starts to act like it is above the rest of us and that it has its needs to be met, when, when Nathan Ivey can't come to a commission meeting at 9 a.m. because he has other obligations, that's a problem. I have a problem with that. The people should be able to participate in the process. Those meetings are their meetings. They're the people's meetings. Well, in, in direct answer to his question, what would you do? And I would just say this. I made that promise to my city. Uh, and I made it a couple years ago, and we made it priority. And now in American Fork City, we stream live. And then we archive it so that everybody can see it at their convenience. We actually have people that uh, on Facebook have a, a site that thousands of people uh, read and watch. And at the end of a council night, somebody takes the live stream and, and where it's archived and posts it. I, I watched some of it last night. And so I would say, if you say, um, are you going to do it? What's your track record? Well, I have done it. And I think it's very important that you do it because, again, without that transparency, it's the termites that undermine government that has to be seen. If you're going to make a mistake, make it in an open. Make it where everybody can see, but, but make it transparent.
This is obviously a critical issue, especially to me, as I mentioned. These meetings directly affect my life, and, and in December when they were talking about raising their pay, my dad had to, to drop my kids off at the bus, and I had to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to get horses fed so I could be at that meeting to, to speak out against that. So I'm willing to make the sacrifices to be there, but it's absolutely essential that we make these meetings and, and government officials more accessible. One thing as far as how do you do it, it's actually not really complicated. You, you, you make the bill, you make the proposal, you get a second, and you vote on it. We have one vote on the commission already with, with Bill Lee. I'm a second vote on that, and, and it's not complicated. Where I come from, we tend to keep things simple and not talk around the issues a bunch, and we just go get things done. This is a very simple issue, and you just do it. <laughs> The recent issue of B BRT was a huge one for many people in this area. That's the bus route. Trans sit. Uh, that, uh, that issue regarded a transit system to be built that would impact much of the Provo Orm area and also had some budget implications. Where did you stand on this issue? Why? And if it comes up again while you are commissioner, what actions will you take? So my position is that transportation is an important issue, as I've addressed previously. Air quality is an important thing, and cars are the number one contributor to bad air. Uh, my position on BRT is, you know, I wasn't involved early on like some of the other people were. Um, however, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about BRT. Some people said that there was a brand new tax that was going to be implemented to pay for BRT. There's actually zero dollars being spent from county revenue because UTA is going to be reimbursing the county for the money that's being spent. What actually happened was the county is responsible for bonding for the, the initial cost for that and then UTA over the course of time is going to be paying the county back for those costs. Now we can get into the question of whether or not UTA is a very efficient entity and I agree with some of the other comments that have been made previously and, and that is not because like has been mentioned, they don't have any sort of representation and there's no accountability there. So I would do something different. So with the bus rapid transit program, the problem that you have is this was something that was originated where we decided to pursue start grant money from the federal government. They laid out a program that said, we'll kick in 75 million, you kick in the other 75 million. The problem with the boondoggle is it's already coming in at a new price tag of 180 million. Yes, UTA has agreed to repay us out of our own sales tax money through the first quarter sales tax and then they will reimburse us over the next 15, 20 years. The problem with this boondoggle is it is a project that ties up all of the third quarter cent sales tax, which is where your road money otherwise would be coming out of. But because we're committing it to an organization such as UTA, a corrupt organization apparently, the problem with that sort of policy is that you are having road needs on the south part of the county, we're having road needs on the north part of the county, and that's a serious problem. So that's that's my issue with this this whole project is I think that it is destined to be a boondoggle. Thank you so much. You know, I was, uh, I was not involved in the inner workings of the bus rapid transit uh, and, and the math behind it. I've learned about it a lot since because it's been a big question and that's been arised and I but I knew basics and I would say this that the 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 thing that I did not like is that it was a a small group of people that made a decision that had a great financial effect upon a large group of people and so at the very least the the BRT should have went to the ballot and let the people decide it was if they knew more than us and they did not trust us or whatever that might be and so I'm thinking if it's a big enough project and it has that great effect and it affects the entire county, then the entire county should have had the ability and afforded to them to, to vote on it and to, to educate themselves on the issue. And so the, the proper role of government at that point would have been to educate you and to make sure you had good facts to base that information and then go to the polls and let the county decide. And uh, that's where I would have addressed it. I was opposed to BRT because it is not an effective and efficient use of taxpayer money. 
Government never spends its money, it spends your money and that's sacred funds and they should be delivered to the areas of greatest need with responsibility. In this particular instance, that was not the case. Not to mention the fact we, had we tied ourselves up with federal money. Federal money is crack, it's a drug, it's addictive. And when you get hooked on it, you lose your freedom and your ability to self-govern. And, and when we get into projects like this, we lose control of our money and funding. That's why I'm opposed to it. The solutions, UTA needs to be put on a performance-based contract. If they don't meet their projections and their ridership usage, they don't get paid. That's how it works in the real world. We can then start to open this up to a more competitive marketplace and get more bang for your buck when we're spending your tax money on something that we need, which is, ma which is mass transit. If we can't pursue that avenue, the people that are making the decisions at UTA absolutely must be accountable to the taxpayer to election. BRT is actually an enormous problem. It's an enormous issue that is multifaceted in almost every way that we look at it. So far, we've kind of heard on past tense. The reality is, is that the new commissioner is going to have to deal with what's dealt and on the table. There's immense property rights issues that are associated with BRT because right now there's 260 different parcels that are at play that have not had any negotiation started with it. They haven't broken ground. They're already talking about going over budget. There's easements. There's a variety of different areas. Right now you have five crosswalks that are not hardly ever used. They're going to seven crosswalks that will require a 90 to a two minute time frame for going across. That's going to add, if you're going from the bus station up to BYU, that's going to add a 15 minute delay. It's going to add extra pollution to the air. There's a variety of areas and that's before you get to the safety issues associated with people going across the areas. I've talked with the engineers, I've talked with different areas, and I'm actually looking at solutions that we'd have to work with. Next question deals with water. Um, kind of a long question. Uh, recently, Salem Hills or Salem Hills, Salem, Salem Spanish Fork Payson, and by extension Woodland Hills and Elk Ridge have had some friction with Strawberry, uh, and there's been some some contention there as how to use it. There was an audit done um, by the Bureau of Reclamation, and there's been a lot of friction regarding water and having enough water. Uh, Representative McKell recently passed a resolution. Uh, that would suggest we remove control of Strawberry and Highline from the Bureau of Reclamation. And so here's the first part of the question. Do you support this move and why? Number two is dealing with water. Would you be willing to support proposals and, and not specific to Payson, but Payson has just done a, re uh, a study on building a reservoir up Payson Canyon. It's $70 million. There's no way Payson can afford it. Is that something that the county should be involved in and, and that city should be involved in to make sure that we have water storage. Well, I'm going to tell you straight up, and there's lots of lights on me because this is the deer in the headlight look for me. Um, I, so I am not, I'm not real well versed in this subject. So I, I'm not trying to deflect from that subject, but I will say this: I recognize how important water is, and in fact, and then we have a very maybe a, a, a water problem on the other side of the, of the county where 200,000 people are downstream from toxic mines where there's going to be a development. So again, a deflection is just maybe what I have done there and the attitude that I have taken, the time commitment to fight for water, to fight for water quality, recognizing how important it is that I would just think that that would be a, an inherent trait that you would see from me because of how important water it is. It sustains life. And so I'm sorry I don't know the specifics of this, and I'm sure some of these other gentlemen will, but I have a, a record of at least knowing, understanding, and fighting for water. I supported it, Representative McKell, in this initiative because it put control where it needed to be, and it also helped to, to take conflict out of a situation. And as a, 
as a good practice in governing, that's something you have to be able to do is resolve conflict and make sure that we come up with the right solution on how to handle those particular instances. As far as, as a dam and, and looking at water, long-term water storage, absolutely, and that's something that we can certainly look at bonding for because we have to provide for things in the future. The reason we have water in the south end of the county currently is because a whole bunch of farmers got together, they went up to Strawberry and they built a dam with an idea of delivering water to this end of the county. If we don't have that same foresight and vision, there's no way that our grandchildren will have the same opportunities for deliverable water that we have. And in, in regards to water, it's, it's essential that we look long term and that we embrace those long term solutions because they're absolutely essential for the well-being of our community. And that's something I'm running on. But when we look at the water, is South County a major issue in the water area? It absolutely is, but we're missing it if we're not, as commissioners, actually taking a look countywide. There's 1.2 million acres in, this, in the county. Of that, roughly 380 acres of that is farmland. We have 60,000 acres under crop pro production areas. So a lot of that restriction in the agricultural area is because of water. When we look at having a dam and a reservoir placed in Payson, I think it's a great idea, but I haven't seen the full studies being put into place that would also have with seismic issues and all the other things that actually need to take place. But would I be in favor of starting those studies? I would. I'll admit that I too am not specifically familiar with this particular proposal. However, I believe that the process really works. Representative McKell is very proactive in working with his constituents and the elected officials uh, that are affected by that issue. And as a commissioner, I don't know that my role would be directly to vote on a policy or procedure that would uh, affect that, but I believe that I could be an advocate and a facilitator for those kinds of discussions. I would work with Payson City, the mayor, the city council members, and, and the other people who are affected by that decision, and work with our elected officials, whether it's Senator Henderson or Representative McHale or other elected officials at the state level that would need to pass a law in, in order to facilitate uh, that kind of a transaction to take place or that type of agreement to take place. What the county needs and, and what it's been lacking is there, there isn't like a there isn't a water guru that is is charging this as we as we head into the future. The problem is when everyone wants to talk about growth, it's always in the context of transportation. But in the second driest state in the union, you are not going to have any growth if there's no water to grow the food or water for the people to drink and use. So obviously, wouldn't it wouldn't it be something if the the money that we've bonded we have. 213 million right now in, in notes, outstanding notes. We are, the county credit card is maxed out. And wouldn't it be something if we decided to develop a project down in Payson? Those of you that have been to the meet and greets, it's been something I've specifically brought up many times is a need for something up in Payson. And, you know, so absolutely that is something I would support. And I would support that far and away and above and beyond a desire to support the county getting into the ice rink business or the museum business or whatever pet project it chooses to be in, whether that's the convention center business. I support us performing our proper role. And just a quick yes, no, for those of you who are blindsided, I apologize. Um, in general, if a city has an issue like that that would affect thousands of, of county residents, would you be favor, would you be willing to partner with the city, whether it's Payson or whoever has the opportunity, would you partner on those issues? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have to work with our municipalities in, in good government. It's essential we work together. When we look at the watershed issues and the criticality of it, we absolutely need to have the county and cities working together, and that's countywide, not just in the south end. I don't know that my answer is, uh, is good enough for a yes or no. I would say yes, we would work with them, but if the county is going to specifically pay for something that's going to benefit a city and one city only, I think that's a different conversation. Uh, so I'm not sure if I understood the question. Would I facilitate that? Yes. Would I agree to use county tax dollars to pay for a specific city's water? No. 
Yes, because we need to be leading the fight for our water. So yes, the county needs to be heavily involved in this type of issue. Yes. Next question deals with water. Um, kind of a long question. Uh, recently, Salem Hills, or Salem Hills, Salem, Salem Spanish Fork Payson, and by extension Woodland Hills and Elk Ridge have had some friction with strawberry, uh, and there's been some, some contention there as to how to use it. There was an audit done um, by the Bureau of Reclamation, and there's been a lot of friction regarding water and having enough water. Uh, Representative McKell recently passed a resolution uh, that would suggest we remove control of Strawberry and Highline from the Bureau of Reclamation. And so here's the first part of the question. Do you support this move and why? Number two is dealing with water. Would you be willing to support proposals and, and not specific to Payson, but Payson has just done a, re uh, a study on building a reservoir up Payson Canyon. It's $70 million. There's no way Payson can afford it. Is that something that the county should be involved in and, and that city should be involved in to make sure that we have water storage. Well, I'm going to tell you straight up, and there's lots of lights on me because this is the deer in the headlight look for me. Um, I, so I am not, I'm not real well versed in this subject. So I, I'm not trying to deflect from that subject, but I will say this: I recognize how important water is, and in fact, and then we have a very maybe a, a, a water problem on the other side of the, of the county where 200,000 people are downstream from toxic mines where there's going to be a development. So again, a deflection is just maybe what I have done there and the attitude that I have taken, the time commitment to fight for water, to fight for water quality, recognizing how important it is that I would just think that that would be a, an inherent trait that you would see from me because of how important water is. It sustains life. And so I'm sorry I don't know the specifics of this, and I'm sure some of these other gentlemen will, but I have a, a record of at least knowing, understanding, and fighting for water. I supported it, Representative McKell in this initiative because it put control where it needed to be, and it also helped to, to take conflict out of a situation. And as a, as a good practice in governing, that's something you have to be able to do is resolve conflict and make sure that we come up with the right solution on how to handle those particular instances. As far as, as a dam and, and looking at water, long-term water storage, absolutely, and that's something that we can certainly look at bonding for because we have to provide for things in the future. The reason we have water in the south end of the county currently is because a whole bunch of farmers got together, they went up to Strawberry and they built a dam with an idea of delivering water to this end of the county. If we don't have that same foresight and vision, there's no way that our grandchildren will have the same opportunities for deliverable water that we have. And in, in regards to water, it's, it's essential that we look long term and that we embrace those long term solutions because they're absolutely essential for the well being of our community. And that's something I'm running on. Well, when we look at the water, is South County a major issue in the water area? It absolutely is, but we're missing it if we're not, as commissioners, actually taking a look countywide. There's 1.2 million acres in, this, in the county. Of that, Roughly 380 acres of that is farmland. We have 60,000 acres under crop prop production areas. So a lot of that restriction in the agricultural area is because of water. When we look at having a dam and a reservoir placed in Payson, I think it's a great idea, but I haven't seen the full studies being put into place that would also have with seismic issues and all the other things that actually need to take place. But would I be in favor of starting those studies? I would. I'll admit that I too am not specifically familiar with this particular proposal. However, I believe that the process really works. Representative McKell is very proactive in working with his constituents 
and the elected officials uh, that are affected by that issue. And as a commissioner, I don't know that my role would be directly to vote on a policy or procedure that would uh, affect that, but I believe that I could be an advocate and a facilitator for those kinds of discussions. I would work with Payson City, the mayor, the city council members, and, and the other people who are affected by that decision, and work with our elected officials, whether it's Senator Henderson or Representative McHale or other elected officials at the state level that would need to pass a law in, in order to facilitate uh, that kind of a transaction to take place or that type of agreement to take place. What the county needs and, and what it's been lacking is there, there isn't like a there isn't a water guru that is is charging this as we as we head into the future. The problem is when everyone wants to talk about growth, it's always in the context of transportation. But in the second driest state in the union, you are not going to have any growth if there's no water to grow the food or water for the people to drink and use. So obviously, wouldn't it wouldn't it be something if the the money that we've bonded we have. 213 million right now in, in notes, outstanding notes. We are, the county credit card is maxed out. And wouldn't it be something if we decided to develop a project down in Payson? Those of you that have been to the meet and greets, it's been something I've specifically brought up many times is a need for something up in Payson. And, you know, so absolutely that is something I would support. I would support that far and away and above and beyond a desire to support the county getting into the ice rink business or the museum business or whatever pet project it chooses to be in, whether that's the convention center business. I support us performing our proper role. And just a quick yes, no, for those of you who are blindsided, I apologize. Um, in general, if a city has an issue like that that would affect thousands of, of county residents would you be favor would you be willing to partner with the city whether it's Payson or whoever has the opportunity would you partner on those issues um, yes <laughs> <laughs> yes we have to work with our municipalities and in, in good government it's essential we work together when we look at the watershed issues and the criticality of it we absolutely need to have the county and cities working together, and that's countywide, not just in the south end. I don't know that my answer is, uh, is good enough for a yes or no. I would say yes, we would work with them, but if the county is going to specifically pay for something that's going to benefit a city and one city only, I think that's a different conversation. Uh, so I'm not sure if I understood the question. Would I facilitate that? Yes. Would I agree to use county tax dollars to pay for a specific city's water? No. Yes, because we need to be leading the fight for our water. So yes, the county needs to be heavily involved in this type of issue. Yes. So the, the possibly last question of the night before you wrap up. The county commissioner seats have, have this has been mentioned already, we've talked about people impersonating uh, ecclesiastical leaders and others. Uh, the county commissioner seats have been for years fraught with corruption, shady dealings, and even candidates with criminal and immorality issues. I know that if asked, all of you will promise to maintain integrity, integrity and remain uncorrupted. But promising that and actually following through have proven to be two different things. What is there in your personal life or daily habits or in your future proactive plans that can help to reassure us that we are electing virtuous and trustworthy officials? First of all, I want to explain a little bit about how I got into this process. Uh, I had a couple people in my neighborhood ask me to run for commissioner. I told them I didn't want to because I hate politicians. And then a couple days later, I had Mike McHale come to my house and ask me what, what, he, what he needed to do to get me to run. And, and he supported me in this, and I can guarantee he did it because he ran a background check on me, because Mike's thorough with those type of things. And, and so, so that's been done. And specifically in relationship to who I am as a character, I can tell you something very important about the way I was raised. I was raised to not be a respecter of persons. Uh, I don't care who you are or where you're from. 
Uh, that's not going to influence my decision about whether something's right or wrong. In, in my line of work, I, I deal with clients that have millions and millions of dollars. I deal with clients that scrape together to give me 800 bucks a month to train their horse. Everybody's horse gets out five, six times a week, gets work, no matter what your background is or who you're from. And, and, and that's just how I've been raised. You treat people the same, and it don't matter who they are, they don't influence you. That's a question that winds up having to have an awful lot of trust in the people. My background includes working really large scale projects and dealing with the people in the State Department in Washington, D.C., and that's a slime pit. I can just tell you that is one really corrupt area. I've got a reputation even there that I'm not interested in lobbyists, I'm not interested in corporate money. I'm not interested in the different areas. I've always used the measure, going back to the oath that I took, where is this in relationship to who I'm supposed to be representing, and any time I'm doing something in a government position, whether as a contractor, working as an advocate for the government, whatever it happens to be, the people come first. When somebody asks, is it really all about you? Really? The answer is yes, it is. It's all about you. Uh, I don't know if there's any sort of integrity test that you can give someone and really, I mean, even lie detector tests can be affected. I, I've always been kind of an old school person that you can do a deal on a handshake and I've taught my kids consistently that telling the truth is more important than being right or wrong. I will look anybody in the eye and tell you that if I make a campaign promise or pledge that I can keep and there are some that you know I, I really don't know because sometimes there are going to be things that come up that I don't know about but I can tell you that I'm not for sale. I can tell you that if you look me in the eye and ask me a question I'm going to tell you the truth even if we differ on our opinions. We can work through differences of opinions as long as we're being honest with each other. The minute that I start to try to tell you something that you want to hear, we, we cheat the process and cheat the citizens. The best thing that was ever done for my character values and my integrity was being born to Sharon Ethel and Vokes, the most wonderful mother that I've ever seen, who's a wonderful example to our family, and, and we, we love my mom. And the reason is, is every day, my brother is here and he can tell you, Every single day, with almost a, a tedious approach, my mom would recite various character values, including and specifically integrity. And she would remind us to thank the lunch lady, be polite at school, reach out to the kid that doesn't have a friend. Those were the values of our family. Those are the ways that we were taught. I think sometimes people wonder, how has Casey had this kind of political involvement? What is he doing? Being raised by a woman who understood that the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. That's the way that I ended up in these roles and that's the way that I end up taking the banner forward on these fights. Thank you. Um, I would just say for me that I have a track record of 50 years of being, you know, that's how old I am. So I'm, I feel like I've, I've had integrity my whole life. It's, it's a part of my core value it's part of my faith, um, and it's very important to me. It's, it, and, and there's no question that there's been some tarnish to the commission and what it means and the people that are in it. And that's one of the reasons that I felt like I needed to step into this. And that's in humility I say that because, I, I, you know, it's hard to talk about yourself in those kinds of ways. But uh, I, I made it a point even in my uh, campaign, if you go on my website, and the, the people that endorse me, I'm not really heading for the big ones. You know, the people that are in office and things like that. I've tried to say, go to my neighbor, have him endorse me, and put, put him, his name on me, the people that know me best. And so it's part of who I am. It's part of how I'll stay, no matter what. Thank you. Um, at this point in time, that will be the close of questions. There are many, many more questions that we can ask. But one of the hopes that I have is that through this process, uh, you have an idea of who the candidates are and now you can follow up with more specific questions. We want to give you time to talk with them after you've heard from them and maybe follow up on some of their answers or some of the other issues. There are a lot of other big issues and I'm sure they're quick to tell you about them. 
Um, so, but in, we're at a point where we need to close now. So we will give you one minute to give your final summary speech. Appreciate being here with you and for your coming out because you're the voice of the, that is representing your communities as delegates. The Constitution to me is a vital part of what our country is. And when I look at our platform and when you're looking at vetting candidates, if you want a checklist, the Republican platform for this county meshes ideally with the Constitution. It talks about family. It talks about educating our children. Proper role of parents in the education. Talks about the role of to the different areas that are associated with our platform because it gives you a really good guideline to judge the character and the responses that are given by the people that you're betting. Thank you. I love this county. I love this country. I have committed myself to making a difference, whether it's in my professional job or as a concerned citizen, getting involved in issues that matter to my community and my family. As a triathlete, I've done several Ironman races, and I spent a lot of time and effort. I'm not afraid of hard work. I'm going to bring that same spirit, that same passion, and I'm going to be the hardest working commissioner that this county has ever had. I will be at every single committee assignment meeting. I will work with every department head and every staff member to the best of my ability, not just during the hours that I'm supposed to be in the office, but after hours with you, after hours with them, doing whatever it takes to make sure that your tax dollars are well, well spent, that the services that we provide to you are done in the most cost effective and efficient manner possible, so that ultimately at the end of the day when I go to bed at night, I know that I've done my best for you. In summary, uh, for, for my remarks tonight, I, I invite you to please go to my website, caseyvokes.com. That will give you a detail on many, many details on my positions on many different issues. But I think that in my life, especially the time that I've been involved in, in the community, in, whether it was my 4,000 volunteer hours at Krista McAuliffe Space Education Center growing up, or it's the thousands of hours that I gave as the party chairman or as a volunteer campaign manager for Mia Love when nobody knew who she was. That time and that record, I think, speaks to who I am and what I stand for. So I invite you to, to please never just place implicit confidence in your public servants, whether it's the people that are running for office here or, or whoever. Make sure that you scrutinize their conduct, scrutinize their past, look at who they are, look at who they've been, and look at what they stand for and what they claim they'll fight for. I'm a consistent conservative. There's nothing about being a campaign conservative that appeals to me. You know, what would I have you remember me from, you know, the last thing? And I would just say, you know, in the county, I see the dynamics. You have three commissioners currently. We wouldn't think it would stay that way, but, uh, and so, I just want you to know that I'm a very independent person in the way that I think. I, I am very methodical. I take in a lot of information and data. I'm not afraid to go to staff. It's how I've operated in my city and in my business and, and just get down into the brass tacks of really what a decision is. And then I make that decision and, and, I, and, I, and I do it with decorum. And I represent things, with, and I think with a, a statesman-like attitude. And, uh, and so I just want you to know that in me, I think you'll get a leader that you'll be proud of. I won't embarrass you. I'll be inclusive. And, and I just would like to think that would be the stamp that I would leave my, any kind of a public service that I, or with my family or in my church or whatever it might be. Thank you. When I was a kid, our, our cattle pen had two different sections, a big holding area and a little small area where you worked the cattle into the squeeze chute. And it had about a 500-pound blue gate that had broken hinges. So my dad had put all 50 pounds of me there armed with a two-by-four. And my job was to turn, you know, a raging mad cow back in and not let it get by me. When I stood there, it was scary to see something coming at me like that, but my dad taught me and I learned from those things that when we stand with courage and we swing with all we got, we can turn scary things away and succeed. 
when we look at the federal overreach and the overreach of government and its improper role, the erosion of our rights and liberties that are happening daily, it's scary. But I can guarantee you with absolute confidence in my heart, I've taken on scary things my whole life, I've stood courageously, and I've swung that two by four, and as your commissioner, I will stand in that gate, I will swing that two by four, and we will beat back the suppression from the federal government and its overreach into our lives so we can live the American dream. Thank you so much for being here today. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. And you can add microphone juggling to your resume. So I really appreciate all the effort you made to be here. And I see you diligently taking notes. You guys are the best. I really appreciate all the research you're putting into these candidates. And thank you again. And feel free to go out to the foyer and speak with them personally.